in this smartphone show a demonstration of the three lib grid find your perfect smartphone simply in all windows mobile i do some tests to find out which platform and which device has the fastest web browser and there's a hands-on demonstration of viewranger on the gps equipped nokia n95 now here's an interesting new concept for smartphones and their working environment. The Palm Folio seems to be a dumb clamshell that piggybacks onto a smartphone's connectivity. Think of it as a Bluetooth keyboard and an external display rolled into one. HTC has announced their Touch, an otherwise uninspiring PDA phone but with extra Apple iPhone wannabe finger-friendly touch extensions to the already stylus-centric Windows Mobile 6 interface. I guess you can say that if you're going to have a touch screen then you might as well use it more, but the finger-friendliness is only really skin deep and the stylus has to come out in most applications in order to actually get anything done. Still, maybe HTC and Microsoft have plans to extend the system further into iPhone territory in the future. I was interested to see that there's a new 4GB micro SDHC that's officially listed as compatible with the Nokia N95. About time. Hopefully SDHC, that's high capacity, support will roll out through some other newish devices and future firmware upgrades. It seems that smartphone maker Sony Ericsson has joined the hundreds of other companies already in the WiMAX forum. Looks like this high-speed data technology could finally take off in the next few years, and it certainly beats wandering cities in search of temporary Wi-Fi hotspots. The public availability of Motorola's Motorizer Z8 UIQ phone is drawing nearer. The latest indications suggest it will be in the shops in Europe in the next few weeks. Here's Motorola's ad for it, if you can call it that. You only actually see the device in the last few seconds. The onslaught of one-box-does-everything devices continues apace with the Toshiba G900 with slide-out, QWERTY keyboard, Windows Mobile 6 Professional, Wi-Fi, biometric, that's a fingerprint to you and me, security, 2 megapixel shooter, HSDPA, and a glorious wide VGA, yes, VGA display that should prove dazzling for web pages and photos, although parts of Windows Mobile still don't work well at that resolution, in my opinion. Early verdicts are in on the Motorola Q9, but I'm not sure this one's even worth pulling in for a smartphone show review, with chunky form factor, no Wi-Fi, disappointingly small screen, proprietary PC connector, and documents to go instead of mobile office. I thought Office came as standard with the professional version of the OS. Now I've been wanting to demonstrate this for a while, but real review hardware on the doorstep kept taking priority. This is my smartphone comparison grid. It lists the major Symbian OS based contenders plus the four major Windows Mobile contenders, in my opinion, the most interesting ones anyway. There's a limited amount of room on the page as you can imagine. Now for each of the devices I've given them scores under about 30 different attributes along the lines of functionality, along word processing, photography, video recording, weight, robustness and so on. In each case, don't worry about the scores for now, simply go down the left hand side and mark in your preferences for each attribute. For example, you might consider one-handed operation very important or not important or quite important and so on for each attribute. So just go down the left hand side plug in your preferences for your perfect smartphone. And the JavaScript behind the page will then do all the maths, add up all the weighted attributes for every single device and present you with colour coded winner and a runner up as here with the Nokia N95 chosen as the winner for my rather random attribute choosing and the Nokia E61i as the runner up. Along the bottom you can see the exact scores for each device so that you can compare third, fourth, fifth and to see where the device you thought was going to be your favourite, your most suitable device, actually turns out to be the case. As you know I've been trialling one of the earliest Nokia E90 communicators and a viewer got in touch to ask how browsing speed was relative to other similar mobile devices. A good question, although there is of course more to web browsing than simple speed. You have to consider physical screen size, display resolution, the rendering intelligence of the browser and compatibility with a variety of emerging web standards. But speed is certainly a large factor in how well the web will work for you. In order to factor out any network bottlenecks, I restricted myself to Wi-Fi compatible devices in order to keep the bytes coming in as fast as the device can accept and process them. The test pages used were my own 3lib front page, a simple HTML table layout, should be nice and quick. My Moblog, a slightly more complicated table site, 
and the CBBC site, an image-rich page from one of the biggest names on the web. Don't worry about the exact pages used. What I was interested in was the relative rendering speeds, i.e. between the devices. I tested five devices in all, in reverse order of speed, and you're going to be surprised at the winner, the Nokia E90 itself, slowest by far, but, and it's a big butt, running pre-production firmware. You can bet that there's still some debug code to be taken out. In fourth place, the Nokia N95, which seemed fast enough, but which was just pipped into third place by the Windows Mobile powered iMate KJAM, uh, which I just happen to have here, which is fairly typical of the performance levels of similar Windows Mobile devices. If nothing else, it shows that the two main smartphone platform web browsers aren't that different in terms of speed. In second place, the Nokia N93 that I'm shooting this on, so I can't show you it, proving that vanilla S60 3rd edition web is quite a bit faster than the feature pack 1 version used in the N95. But fastest of all, and again this was just a device I happened to have lying around, is the three-year-old Palm TX handheld. I'm guessing that the speed of the TX is partly down to the fact that it hasn't got to manage a few dozen phone processes in the background and that it's simply more focused. Overall though, there really weren't any dramatic differences. Rather than concentrating on raw speed, a more apt web-related attribute to consider when choosing a new smartphone is the display resolution and the browser's compatibility with the interactive sites that you like to use. OK, so the smartphone show budget wouldn't quite stretch to a trip across the Andes, but I've come to a country park to test out the view ranger on the Nokia N95. You'll remember that the Nokia N95 has a built-in GPS, like uh, several cutting-edge smartphones of the moment. It's a low-power GPS, it's pretty insensitive, and it takes a while to lock on, but in open skies like this, it's fine once it's locked on. You can think of ViewRanger as a kind of interactive map for your smartphone. Traditional route planning software, satellite navigation, gives you road-by-road -road instructions. ViewRanger is for the great outdoors, as here, whether just maybe footpaths or just plain open fields. Essentially, as you wander around, it locks your track against the map, it shows you exactly where you are on the map, and, as shown here, it shows you a panorama of the, the exact view you should be seeing based on your current walking speed and direction in terms of hills and contours and features to watch out for. Now, obviously, I'm here in California Country Park in Berkshire, and it's dead flat in all directions, and I haven't got the budget to go trekking up to Wales or Scotland, to, to show you some of the screenshots I'm showing here. This is the panorama function uh, when used at its best, so you can identify the hills and the peaks around you. This software really is a walker's dream. Now, of course, how well or badly it works does depend on the hardware involved. In this case, the low RAM in the N95, or relatively low RAM, means that uh, although view ranger starts OK and can coexist with your contacts, calendar and general phone calling, the moment you start up something else, like, for example, the camera, which you might well do if you're out in the great outdoors, um, taking a, a 5 megapixel stills image, the camera shuts view ranger down and you have to open it again uh, and wait for it to load into RAM. This is very frustrating. But when it's working, it works excellently. I don't think I've seen quite such a, a polished and well-presented application in a long, long time. The core functions of mapping and panoramas work well. There's a buddy system uh, based around an internet connection to its own server where you can keep track of the GPS position last reported by your buddies, also out there with ViewRanger accounts and smartphones. And there are all sorts of extras, including the taking photos as you go around, logging what you do, what you see, uploading it to a server, again, so that people can follow your adventures and your journeys. View Ranger can be expensive if you go for the full uh, Great Britain Maps pack, but if you're a hobbyist walker, if you love being in the great outdoors, you're going to be using this one or two months a year, uh, out walking on weekends and weeks away, and you're going to get full value for money for this. Uh, especially on future devices with more RAM, ViewRanger is an absolute, absolute must. Yeah.